Hey everybody, Josh RV Nerd, Ambitious RV here, as the sign behind me clearly indicates. Back with another month of industry updates. We're going to go through and keep with the trend uh, you folks seem to like where we kind of dive into like the, uh, you know, the, the market stats in terms of shipments versus sales and like used RV values. And we're going to hit all those baseline factors that have really become a cornerstone of this. Then we're going to dive into just some various things that are happening through the industry. Some of which are really cool. Some of which are potentially very concerning, like uh, some things happening with within the aluminum industry that may have a massive, massive impact on, well, frankly, a lot of American life, especially the RV industry. We're gonna go through that all with uh, prob probably too windy of a fine tooth comb. And if you appreciate the information that we're giving you, make sure you hit that subscribe button, like our video, and uh, you know, let, let us know what you're thinking about this and maybe share this into like your favorite little Facebook social groups if you think something like that might be handy. Let's get started. So kicking us off this month again, the, kind of the, the core backbone of what this industry update series has become, just looking at the rate and flow of the RV industry. We're gonna begin by looking at the scary charts here, uh, kind of showcasing RV shipments this year in 2023 versus 2022. Um, and, and while you're doing that, you know, I'm gonna have some various bar charts and number charts come up that you can, you know, pause the video and digest at your own uh, rate. By the way, if you want to pause the video and really dive into something, but your screen on your phone turns dark, just tap the screen, not on the play button again, and that dark filter, that overlay will go away so you can sit there and just read stuff however you want to. The more you know. Anyway, uh, it continues to be a tale of two cities. Um, uh, overall, shipments this year are down significantly from last year. The gap has closed a little bit. Uh, there were points this year where uh, shipments in 2023 were more than 53% less than last year, uh, and that is down to about a 48% gap right now. But let's not mince words. Okay, 48 from 53, it's 5% better. Well, I'm not. The, the fact is, it's off about 50%. Let's just call a spade a spade, a duck a duck. Vastly fewer RVs are being built this year versus last year. The really interesting thing about all of this though is that RV sales and RV shipments continue to not really follow the same trends and there's going to come a point uh, where I don't think that that can continue and I'm kind of shocked that it's really lasted this long but overall RV sales are down 16 percent versus last year. Uh, so uh, a couple of things. So like what's causing that 53 percent fewer RVs this year to move down to a 48% gap. Um, a lot of it is RV dealerships had a lot of aged inventory in stock and with the new 24s now in full tilt production, they had to get off of some of their existing inventory. And uh, that caused manufacturers through the bulk of the summer camping season, the summer calendar year, to really, um, you know, uh, dealerships weren't ordering as much because they were forcing existing inventory out, so manufacturers were much slower as a result. Well, now a lot of dealerships are getting off that 23 and 2022 inventory, although there's still some of that out there. You can get some, some solid deals on some of that stuff still. Uh, the uh, manufacturers are seeing kind of a uh, a kind of a return to 2019 fall production trends, which is healthy. That was that was a healthier time in the RV industry in terms of overall even consistent pace and flow of things. But um, it's it's kind of interesting. Both towables and motorized were both down almost exactly 16 percent. Um, in, uh, in terms of uh, sales and registrations, actual RVs purchased, 16% fewer of them in the most recent month stats and year to date. The, 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 the most recent month and the, and the year versus year comparison of 22 to 23 was nearly identical in terms of percentage ratio, which I thought was really interesting. And the most recent stats I think come from August. So that's an eight month uh, spectrum. That's a decent, you know, uh, amount of time right there. There's there's obviously still time for winter time to kind of throw some throw a wrench into the works, but um, I, I I think what's happening here is also as interest rates have increased. Not only has that slowed consumer interest in buying an RV just because of how it affects direct affordability factors, since uh, the vast majority of RVs are financed, certainly. But also, those interest rates affect dealerships, so dealerships are carrying fewer RVs on hand. So dealerships came into the year with a nasty surplus of inventory that largely is due to mismanagement uh, of their own inventories. Uh, dealerships love to say how manufacturers overproduce, but the fact is, uh, 
the manufacturers aren't going to necessarily keep building stuff if nobody's buying it, nobody meaning the dealers. So, you know, dealerships allowed themselves to get overflowed with inventory. They had a surplus coming into the season. They weren't reordering things. And then interest rates went higher. So inventories have shrunken over time. And it's really funny because a lot of people have left comments on these videos saying, oh man, dealerships are just overflowing, packed with inventory. Roll the clock back on this channel a little bit. Um, it was very common uh, four or five years ago for the facility that I'm at to actively carry four to 500 RVs. And at one point we had bulked up to just over 700 actively in stock and on hand at this location. Uh, right now we have between two and 300 and people are saying that we're packed, overflowing with RVs. It's, it's just funny how perspectives change over time, but when you saw absolutely nothing in stock at some places for about two years, and then you suddenly see a store has full inventory again, or seemingly full by comparison, I totally get how that skews the perspective. But um, there's just some interesting number trends on there. And with interest rates expected to really pretty much hold steady roughly where they're at right now, um, uh, I don't necessarily expect RV dealerships to just go nuts bulking up on inventory because when inventory sits around too long, it costs that dealership extra money. And, uh, you know, the older an RV gets, the less somebody seems to want to pay for it. So I think you're going to see RV dealerships start working on a, more of, a, you know, picking the right units in stock and having fewer of them on hand, which means, you know, you'll see a, a more regular flow of inventory, but m there will be times that, you know, your preferred certain awesome, super popular model might not be in stock somewhere at a given time, but then it'll come back and then it'll be gone. Gee, I, that last segment was a lot. I try to keep my segments normally like two to three minutes each, and I will chapter mark this video, by the way, so you can more easily bounce around and navigate to what you want to go to. Hopefully you find that beneficial and helpful. But that last one was like two or three segments that just kept kind of one flowing into the other. So that's really the super fast look at the current flow condition of the, uh, the, the new RV market in terms of like production versus sales. Uh, the used RV market looking at wholesale uh, auction values is starting to return finally to more traditional seasonal norms and cycles. The, the phrase that we use here around Southern Michigan is as the leaves start falling, the prices start falling. The pricing follows the leaves, or sometimes we'll say that the pricing follows the temperature, which also is very true where I'm from. I don't know if it holds up uh, necessarily nationwide is on your side. Um, uh, the don't don't sue me by the way nationwide anyway looking at the charts and the graphs here you can see for yourself uh, there's uh, overall if if you step back looking at both the towable and the motorized charts right here the overall trend over about a year and a half is a very slow decline in overall average pricing and obviously especially motorhomes uh, it's like one month it jumps up, one month it jumps down. I think a lot of the, the weirdness in terms of that motorized uh, value chart in the most recent series of months here is because there was a model year change in the motorhome industry. I think that maybe the, I don't, well, no, that would apply to the, the towable industry too. I don't know. I guess I don't understand why the, the motorhome industry values seem to spike up one month and spike down the next. And it's been a very normal trend of that. But overall, if you look at the bar chart over the last year and a half, pricing is slowly declining. I think the biggest reason the towable RV market is more consistently declining uh, in the used market is due to the fact that uh, manufacturers have been really building, some brands call it basic series, essential series, limited series, but a lesser expensive series of offerings there. And you know, if somebody could get a, a new RV and a used RV for the same price, they're gonna get the new RV more than likely that also includes some kind of warranty. If they can get a deal on that used one that's enough to offset a warranty or maybe some kind of, I don't know, scuff or conditioning on that RV, some personality on it as it were, then maybe they'll go that route. But as the new RV market prices come down, the used RV market has to follow with it. Otherwise, no one's gonna buy used RVs. Another interesting thing is it looks like there's fewer trades coming in out there, which is not necessarily unusual this time of year. Uh, that, that follows kind of like the historical trends that I've observed. But the, the charts that I'm showing you, those are like wholesale auction volume numbers. 
uh, what they don't represent is any sort of uh, private seller sort of thing. So I did just some quick basic surface recon on things like RV Trader, Facebook Marketplace, etc., looking for uh, private owner listings. And there's a lot of them. There's a lot, a lot of them. I suspect that there would be more influx into the used RV market, but I think that there's a lot of people who bought something uh, at the peak of the market when the cost of everything was up. You know, some people would were saying, man, I sold my old used RV for more than I paid for it. And then they bought a new one for even more money then. And now they're, they're, you're, they're kind of, they're kind of married to that sucker. I think that there's a lot of people who would like to change their RV, but the, their loan to value ratios are unfortunately just screwy because the market has changed and the market isn't currently supporting the, the big high dollar value that they paid on their RVs at that time. Um, we're also going to see how that trend is also coming back to bite some dealerships uh, in the bud in uh, a, a little bit here. But um, that, that's kind of the, the coming and going of the new and used RV markets right now. Again, the trend is pricing shoots up like a rocket and it comes down like a parachute. And it is coming down. And I hope that trend continues. And I hope interest rates don't keep going up. That would be lovely. Hopefully interest rates, we see a little bit of relief on that next year. I have no insight on that, by the way. Every All current indicators and interest rates look like they're gonna stay very steady. Uh, but again, that could change next month. I, 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 uh, the government quit returning my emails. I don't know what's gonna happen. <laughs> But if you rewind the footage here just a little bit, I said that there's a lot of private owners who are trying to privately sell their RV that I think would like to trade up into something. Um, that's a little bit of a theory, but uh, I, I kind of base it on the fact that like KOA, Campgrounds of America, they, they are always constantly doing studies and putting info out. They're an awesome resource that's publicly available there. But they found that like basically 50% of campers already have some level of booking into the 2024 calendar year people are already booking stuff up pretty heavily into next year and uh there's also been something like a 23 percent uptick in interest in like fall and winter camping i think i talked about that a little bit more in depth uh last year but I, I, I think that there were a lot of people that thought, holy cow, all these people are flooding to the RV industry. All these new buyers, they're not going to like it. And they're going to want to get out of it. And it doesn't really, there's, there's instances. Of course, there's going to be some instances. Some people don't like the thing that they bought. That is a thing that happens. But um, by and large, for the very most part, people are continuing to camp. Now, whether that's because they want to continue to camp or, hey, we spent the money on this thing as long as we have it, we're gonna use it. Like, I could see that also being a thing. I am that kind of person who gets Clark W. Griswold uh, like, no, no, you're, you're gonna go on that roller coaster. We paid for it. Like, I don't get that crazy with it, but it's like, that's, that is, it's like, man, we, we spent the money, we're here, we ought to do this. And sometimes it's more about focusing on what's actually fun versus like just actually going through the paces. But what, which one of those examples happens to be the case for a lot of the, uh, the, the private sellers out there is not exactly clear. So I'd be kind of curious, uh, anybody out there, actually, this is what would help everybody. Let's crowdsource some information from you folks. Leave us a comment. Are you a person who is currently trying to privately sell your RV? And are you uh, trying to update and upgrade or change your RV? Or are you trying to get out of your RV? And uh, for those who are trying to get out of their RV, if you'd be so kind, are you still actively using your RV in the meantime? Or is that something where you've just said, this just isn't for us, we're just gonna try to sell and get out of it. If you could leave everybody some feedback in the comment section, that would be super helpful straight from you directly. But flipping that script a little bit, going from talking about RV buying and selling to actual dealership buying and selling, the dealership acquisition market has changed as violently and dramatically as the RV market in general has. I've kind of talked about this a little bit, um, where basically during the pandemic fueled period, um, uh, dealerships that were kind of struggling suddenly found themselves able to be very profitable and many of them were having like near record years and a lot of dealerships were doing very very well but I mentioned earlier in this video how 
uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of stores in the RV industry across multiple organizations, whether it's a single point like mom and pop shop or a multi-chain organization, their stores, they allow themselves to get over inflated with inventory as though the, the, like it was an unlimited faucet that was never going to be turned off with customers just pouring out of the thing. Any person who's reasonable would realize that's not always going to be the case. So there was this period coming out of the pandemic production and sales era, if you will, the, the post pandemic period of the RV industry, where uh, a lot of dealerships suddenly found themselves with a lot of inventory on hand, customers were slowing down, interest rates were going up, and a lot of people cashed in their chips and got out of the industry at that time. Good for them. Not a critique, by the way, just, just an, uh, that's a literal thing that happened, frankly. Um, you know, it was kind of the right conditions where my own family's store made that transition at that time and chose to join up with Bish's RV. I've just simply enjoyed staying on with the company here. They've treated me very well. And they've lived up to every promise they said they'd ever made for me and more. Um, the uh, After that, though, there was this massive wave of dealership acquisitions and campgrounds. You saw uh, more and more RV dealerships and campgrounds falling under the banner of bigger groups, some bigger than others, certainly. Well, um, a lot of that has really cooled off. As uh, market conditions have continued to evolve overall, RV sales business is, uh, again, still down from like what it was last year, which is down from the year that it was before. You know, we've already put the numbers on screen. There's no real debating or denying any of that. Like that's a real thing that's happening. And interest rates have climbed up and stayed very consistently at that, uh, you know, at their current level, again, with no relief in that regard expected in sight. So as a result, what's happened here is a lot of your larger dealership groups who are in a position to expand and acquire other stores or just f build new brick and mortar have have, a lot of them have basically, um, you know, battened down the hatches and said, you know, we're not in a bad spot. We're healthy, but we're not going to keep just expanding at this breakneck pace. Um, you know, we we want to make sure that we can stay liquid and viable and, and not be up to our ears and stuff. Um, now, certainly there's some groups that have continued to expand. They have the resources to do that. Let's just call a spade a spade a duck a duck. This, this again is not a critique. It's just a literal thing that's happening that you can Google. Like uh, Camping World just announced that they are acquiring a uh, travel camp RV, which has, I think, a dozen stores uh, like Florida, Georgia, the, the Carolinas, Texas, something like that. You know, they're joining the Camping World team. Good for you. I hope that works out very well for you. Have uh, again, uh, no animosity just because you wear a different shirt than I do or anything like that. So there is still some acquisitions going on there. But what I think is kind of happening is I think that there are some of those smaller single point distribution stores. That's a technical term. Mom and pop shop is kind of what a lot of us have called it for the years that are struggling. And I think that you're going to see a reduction in the number of different dealerships, basically different names of different dealerships as some of these smaller groups, unfortunately can't weather the storm through one reason or another and may have to close their doors. I think that there's some independent stores out there that are just struggling in the current market climate, whether it's, you know, any fault of their own or not. And whether um, bigger box stores acquire them or they just simply shutter their doors, I think you're going to, to continue to see that. And you're even seeing, um, you know, some bigger groups kind of trim uh, trim the fat and trim off a few of their lesser performing stores, but continue to still expand overall. That's just, uh, in a way, that's just smart business. But that's kind of the trend that I am seeing in terms of RV dealerships out there. And I think that's important to look at because I've long said, like I, I'm standing next to a Wildwood over here. You could get that at a couple hundred different locations across the nation. I, I feel very, very strongly that you are choosing to buy the dealership as much as you're choosing to buy the RV that you're getting from that dealership. Uh, because there's very little, you know, being real, there's very little that happens here that couldn't happen somewhere else. So, you know, you, you have to make your choice on where you're going to go and where you're going to take your business. And when you start having fewer and fewer options, that sometimes doesn't feel awesome, unless, <laughs> 
the people that you want to buy from are the ones that are growing in which case good for you so <laughs> you know there's just there's a there's a real change and a real shift and that really follows historical trends there's nothing new about what's happening in the rv industry right now in terms of consolidation that hasn't already happened in the auto industry or look at hotels look at like everything belongs to like a, a hilton a uh, 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 a Wyndham or whatever you know it's like they have there's like 20 different hotel brand names that all answer under the one same hotel overarching banner the same thing's happening in the RV industry now it just strangely had never really happened to the degree that it's happening currently it has happened at the manufacturing level when times are good, you see new little manufacturers spring up. And then when things get tight, you see acquisitions happen on the manufacturing level. Um, we just haven't seen it at the dealership level until really the last couple years. And I could be wrong. It's just my nerdy little theory, my nerd Stradamus prediction. I don't think you're going to see it trend away from kind of where we're headed, but that's just my two cents. Where do you think things are gonna go? And really going right along with that trend I just mentioned where some of the smaller uh, independents are kind of struggling currently, Regency RV is a manufacturer that recently uh, basically filed bankruptcy and is closing its doors. They made um, uh, Class B vans, like things on that Mercedes-Benz like Sprinter chassis, and there was a period in I think it was November of 2022 there was a significant sprinter chassis recall and it was basically a stop don't ship don't sell like the manufacturer they they were just Regency was no longer able to even fulfill their orders at that time and uh, as a result had difficulty meeting some of their financial commitments and it just has recently decided to uh, to, to hang up their spurs so this, uh, you know, the market conditions that I'm talking about are certainly not at all limited to exclusively just um, RV dealerships, but you know, it's a very real thing that affects manufacturers. And then, you know, that can trickle down supply to dealerships, to customers, and there can be, you know, a knee bone to leg bone uh, effect and ramification there. And that's one of the examples of it. I never like seeing when a manufacturer goes under because that represents a lot of households and families that were depending on that for their income that now have to go elsewhere and that gets tougher. So uh, I like to see when people succeed, not fail. And right now it's nothing but it may be something that has significant impact through the entirety of the RV industry, whether something's a stick and tin or a, a laminated build or like a aluminum body like an Airstream. There are investigations happening right now into the practices of how basically aluminum uh, suppliers are selling into the United States. And it, it, it could potentially be a really big deal. So what happened here, is uh, the Aluminum Extruders Council and United Steelworkers, I think, um, filed a formal complaint uh, that the International Trade Commission is currently at the time this, R, uh, this video comes out, this RV, this video comes out, they're basically investigating. We won't see any sort of initial decisions or results of that until at, I think at earliest November 20th. So about a month after this video comes out, pretty close. Hopefully, uh, if you know if there's any significant update to this, I'll try to give you a, a bump on this story uh, next month. So stay tuned for that. But what's happening here is the complaint is that there are unfair practices happening in the aluminum trade industry that are allowing foreign suppliers to undercut U.S. based suppliers by anywhere from like 28% cost to up to 257% cost was the greatest example that I saw where it's, you know, threatening these American companies and they're saying, you know, because of, uh, you know, the, the various production things that we have in place that we have to follow in this country it just costs us more to make this product even uh, you know domestically and even though there's not international shipping associated with this and they're looking for a little bit more of a, a level playing ground um what happens with this is again currently totally up in the air everything is still in the investigatory phase but again uh, if you think about it so like every fiberglass rv you see typically well not every one of them many of the fiberglass rvs that you see out there have uh aluminum structures and you think okay well that wouldn't really affect the stick built ones then well okay well the stick built campers typically have a huge amount of aluminum skin and then you have brands even like airstream that are basically uh you know silver twinkie rolling down the road i don't mean that derogatory just that's what they look like to me anyway if that offends someone i'm sorry that wasn't my goal uh the uh, the thing here is 
if you see a big spike in the cost of aluminum, it actually will affect stick and tin campers more than laminated RVs. So you'll see the pricing of a stick and tin camper come up closer to a laminated RV, which will drastically change the, uh, the uh, overall balance in the marketplace. Um, you may see at that point an increase in the number of brands, stick and tin builders who start offering a fiberglass skin on top of a wood structure to help circumvent some of that, which is still a slightly more expensive uh, way of building an RV, but it might end up being cheaper than going with an aluminum skin, something that is currently often viewed as an upgrade may have to become the more budget-friendly standard method of uh, production. Now again, that is all way out in the future. None of that is happening now. Those are just some things that I could see happening. If I hear anything more significant on this that would uh, you know, uh, affect you in a way, I'd let you know. But think about it, it's not just RVs. Like vehicles, like I just got a newer vehicle recently here. I'd, I'd call it a truck, but it's a Ford Maverick. It's, that's not much of a truck, but I love my vehicle. Anyway, it's a very comfortable car with a bed. <laughs> But so much of my vehicle is aluminum. You know, the bodies of these things, so many of these things, some of the chassis are aluminum now. Um, you know, so many of your electronics use some level of aluminum. Like there's just tons and tons of uses for it that are in our everyday lives. That if the cost of that starts going up significantly because some sort of trade practices need to be adjusted, it could have major far spread impacts, far beyond what happens just here in the RV industry. So stay tuned on that. Shifting over to manufacturing news, I know this video runs long and I talk more than I need to and I don't do it on purpose. It's just, that's just where my, I have a very train of thought kind of process. I'm doing it now, sorry. Uh, manufacturing news, uh, Grand Design recently here uh, has expanded their um, their use of ABS, anti-lock braking systems from all of their fifth wheels and reflection and momentum travel trailers to also, uh, that, that'll be expanding down into the Imagine series, so basically, any grand design that's laminated will have factory standard anti-lock braking. And they're making it, uh, the, the axle supplier uh, who, is, who is doing that system for them is making it easier to identify because basically your, uh, what looks like your like brake hubs assembly, that kind of thing, uh, they're going to be red. So you can just look at that thing and know that you're going to have anti-lock braking. Um, Grand Design also, I want to give them a little tip of the metaphorical hat here. Uh, they recently got very involved in the uh, the Toys for Tots, uh, you know, collection and drive happening in Elkhart County, and that's something that I've I've just always had a soft spot for. I I I I, I very much like to see things done for the benefit of children, and that is one of those that I've always had. I love the I love the holiday season. I I really really love it. No matter what holiday you like to celebrate, I think that it's a good reminder of um, you know good times and uh, bringing people together instead of dividing people apart and anything that helps support kids and those seasons I like to see them uh, additionally Grand Design I don't know if you uh, saw my preview uh, video that came out where they announced two entire new series of RVs they've also recently announced that they're going to be getting into a third new series of RVs and a completely new market Grand Design will be entering the motorized RV market. Um, Don Clark uh, over there at Grand Design, uh, basically the big head honcho over there, if you weren't aware, uh, he, he kind of made a statement. He said, motorized has always been on the table, but we're really in a position we can go into it. And a lot of people have said, it seems like a really weird time to be getting into the motorized market. And I get why you say that, for sure. But the funny thing is, this is the best time for an RV manufacturer to expand and diversify their offerings uh, because they actually have development time. During the pandemic period, you remember when I was putting these videos out, how I would often explain how manufacturers are, are putting a more narrow focus on their catalog? Manufacturers who once had like 20 models, 20 floor plans would narrow things down to like 12, eight, eight, six sometimes, they would narrow them down and say, we're only building our very best sellers so we can maximize production. Well, that's not a problem right now. When manufacturers are producing 48% fewer RVs, they have open facility time where they can build, develop, tweak, play with new things and kind of expand their catalog. So that's, that's almost the irony. It's the exact opposite of what you would uh, imagine. Uh, RV manufacturers get more diverse rather than less diverse when times aren't a plenty, which I think is kind of interesting. And speaking of ABS, I don't know if they've even made the official public announcement. I probably should have checked before I ran my mouth in this video, but it's a thing that's gonna happen regardless. Keystone Cougar 
is going to uh, adopt standardized anti-lock braking across their entire lineup. So, uh, you know, Grand Design was the first major manufacturer to offer something like that in a towable RV application. You're seeing more manufacturers start adopting it, and they're going to be doing it on their trailers, their fifth wheels, their big series, their sport series. They're going to uh, prioritize towing safety across the board. And again, tip of the metaphorical hat to anybody who dives into that. That is one of those things that I personally believe in very, very strongly. You are never going to regret your RV having that extra towing safety system, but you might regret if it's not there. In fact, people have asked me, you know, if I feel so strongly about it, why do our ambitious exclusive Go Play series of RVs not have ABS? I, I wish they did. I don't get to make that decision, but I wish they did. I'm fully in support of that. Now, kind of continuing the ABS trend here, um, Jayco, I, I don't know if you caught this, uh, in the 2024 models, basically anything that is a full-blown Eagle, above the level Eagle HE, so Eagle, North Point, Pinnacle, Seismic, will also have uh, a uh, anti-lock braking system. What's cool is they're, uh, they're using Dexter Toe Assist, and you can tell because there's like a white and black, looks like hockey puck on the, the front side of the, the underside of the gooseneck area of that fifth wheel. Um, but any of the 24s are going to have it. The, uh, the thing is, it's also electronic anti-sway. So not only will it help you in a panic emergency brake situation, but like if you get hit by a wicked cross breeze or something like that, anytime the RV shifts, I think it's something more than five degrees off axis, the system, without you even needing to think about it, it just automatically plays with the brakes a little bit to straighten the RV back out and get right back behind you, which I think is very, very cool. Also, Jayco needs your help they are starting they're piloting a gps program where they they're basically it's open enrollment effectively for anyone that owns a 2019 to 2024 j flight um i'll leave a link in the video description or you can scan the qr code here on the screen if you own a 2019 to 2024 j flight six model years worth of rvs out there what they basically want to do is they want to track you know, where people are taking RVs. And with J-Flight being one of the most popular things out there, the fact that they have such wide, there's a J-Flight everywhere, whether they're big or small, they thought it'd be a really good way to get really good market data. And their goal is to develop uh, basically a, uh, a GPS system to help navigate their RVs, as well as help uh, recommend places that you could potentially take it because uh, there, there's this really funny thing where like we talked about how people are already booking into campgrounds next year and if you've watched my industry update videos this year I've talked very often about how some people feel that campgrounds are congested and they're having trouble finding places but it's interesting if you actually read the comments it's a tale of two cities there's a lot of people that said yeah I had a hard time getting online and getting a booking or anything like that but while I was traveling if I called ahead, sometimes I'd have to call two places, but I always found a place I could park, and a lot of times when I got there, they had plenty of open sites. So I think that there's a lot of people that have plenty of places they could go camp, but they don't know where those places are. So Jayco's goal is to help you find places to camp more easily and, God forbid, uh, find a way to re-implement a little bit of spontaneity into the RV lifestyle. That used to be one of the things that was a very attractive aspect of the RV lifestyle. You could just say, I had a bad week at work this week. Let's hook up and get away from it all. Let's go three hours away and just park down somewhere and just relax and zero out and we'll go back to, to being normal again next week. And you kind of lost a lot of that. You had to start planning RV trips the way you had to plan a trip to see Mickey Mouse. You know, it takes a lot of time and, and uh, planning ahead. That's not something you typically do just on a Tuesday, unless you're already like a park membership owner or whatever and live locally. Hey, my, my point here is, if you're interested, you can enroll, sign up, and I don't know, maybe help develop the next generation of like RV owner assisting navigation. And if you're newer to the RV industry, whether you're a new salesperson, a potentially new customer, anything like that, or if you just are getting your first new RV after having owned one for like 10 years, it can be daunting. You look at all these names, all these companies, all these brands, they all claim to be the best. And if you go to like some RV show where there's 10 different RV dealers, if you, have, if you ask the person that you're talking to, hey, I was also looking at the camper that that place sells next door, which one's better? Have you ever had the person in front of you say, yeah, yeah, that one's better. The one they sell is better than ours. You know, it's never gonna happen. So it can be very daunting trying to figure out uh, where, where do you like, 
which one do you look at? Which one do you think you could have a little more confidence in potentially purchasing, going out, having a good time? Well, every year, RVDA, uh, the RV Dealers Association, puts out these polls and basically puts out their best of the best DSI awards. And these are based on, um, you know, product that shows up clean, that has good warranty fulfillment in the event that things are needed that uh, you know, customers report being happier with, all those sorts of things are kind of factored and averaged and aggregated out. And the list that's scrolling down here on the screen, these are the basically the, the top level award winners. Now, I have never said, nor will I likely ever say, there's the perfect RV. I don't, I don't know that I've ever seen a perfect RV, nor do I ever expect necessarily to. I don't like that, but I'm being real about this, you know? Um, these though, are the brands that more often than not, folks were uh, very happy purchasing, owning, and uh, said, you know, we would do it again, given the opportunity. So if you're new to this and you're wondering which way to go with your money, those might be some uh, companies within the towable and motorized RV industry to start looking to see if maybe they have something that just looks right, looks right, feels right, smells right to you. Now this next thing is something I found that tends to be rather triggering to some people in the comment section. Again, that's not my goal, but it is the thing that's happening and it's related to EVs and RVs like uh, Mr. Tesla back here. Um, there has been in the last couple of years a lot of government funding put out there designed to basically reinvent the EV charging landscape and uh, the, uh, the, the, the push for EV friendly RVs and even all electric motorhomes, it's not seeming to die out. I think a lot of people thought it would, but it, as long as there's money behind it, that's probably not going to be the case. Um, now, RVIA uh, is kind of the governing body for the RV industry. They have some, some uh, lobbyists that are out there basically trying to really help under, uh, get people to understand that with all this money that's coming in to build this uh, charging landscape, there needs to be a focus on things like pull-through charging sites that generally aren't very widely found right now. And if you're going to do anything uh, RV related, especially towable, like if you have an electric vehicle, you would have to pull up, unhook your RV somewhere, go get into the charging station, get rehooked your vehicle. It's very step-by-step -step laborious, you know? And um, what's kind of fueling this uh, is there, there's been some interesting, interesting uh, studies in terms of uh, leisure travelers and how it relates to EVs and RVs. So all these stats that I'm about to throw at you here, these are based on leisure travelers, people who are uh, traveling, camping, moving around, uh, just purely due to recreation and choice. 30% of leisure travelers who have traveled in an RV own an electric vehicle. That's, that's very interesting to me. 17% of leisure travelers that have used an RV, uh, they, they do plan uh, to buy an electric vehicle within a year, and an additional 16% of those uh, do plan to buy an electric vehicle sometime after a year. So more and more people, you know, moving into that market space. 50% um, of the leisure travelers that own an electric vehicle do intend to tow an RV with it. That's, that's also another kind of pretty crazy stat. Um, and I'm not gonna lie, these numbers that are flashing up here on the screen, they really took me by surprise. Uh, I just, I, those are higher numbers than I kind of expected myself. Um, I guess I kind of have questions for you folks out there. What is EV ownership like in your neck of the woods? And uh, do you see a connection between you know EV ownership and RV use? Uh, I, I think where I live in Michigan, where like things like Tesla factory direct elect, uh, electric uh, vehicles are, it, they, can't, they can't do business here. It's not legal for them to do business here. Like in Michigan and a lot of states, you're legally required to go to a government mandated middleman, AKA a dealership to purchase your vehicles. So uh, maybe that's where my local perspective is skewed on that. But I know that sometimes as I've traveled, I found quite a few of those vehicles around. So I'm kind of curious again to hear from you, like what is EV ownership like where you're from and how do you see it affecting kind of future of RV industry development? But uh, along with the various sort of challenges and you could almost say potential roadblocks currently facing a more widespread distribution and RV related use of uh, electric vehicles, a new problem is emerging. Um, 
failing charging stations. So uh, what what we're finding here, what's kind of happening, and of, of you know, it makes perfect common sense when you say it out loud, but in, apparently not a lot of people had enough forethought to put into this, where uh, we, as just a, a country, basically, I'm not saying we bishes or you or whatever, but anyway, the there, there's a big focus and and all this money into building all these electric charge stations. And yes, there's there's concerns like, okay, well, how, how do we power the power stations? How do we power the charging stations? Um, well, you know, with it takes a long time to recharge a vehicle versus just fill a fuel tank. You know, that's a potential concern. There's, there's, there's roadblocks, there's challenges, certainly. And it's not that they're necessarily impossible to solve. It's just that they're very real challenges currently right now. Well, a new one is happening as this infrastructure gets used, abused, damaged, aged, weather factors, etc., are, are putting strain on it. About 6% of active charging stations out there right now are, well, not active. About 4,000, just under 4,000 charging stations for uh, electric vehicles out there are not currently in service and working. They broke, and there's not enough people to take care of them. Uh, uh, charge station technicians are just not readily available. And you think, well, why don't you just call your local electric workers union? It's a different thing. It's not the same thing, uh, basically. So, you know, they're, they're, that's, that's a new challenge. That There needs to be a dialogue there. If we're going to have all these new charging stations, we need people that can take care of them because otherwise we're gonna have a whole lot of basically out of business gas stations for electric vehicles out there that are gonna do nobody any good. I'm kind of curious, have you, you live in a neighborhood that has a dead charging station? I don't personally, but in my little small town, I think we've got one, one electric vehicle charger locally. And before you ask, no, I'm not referring to the little mini generator my Uncle Gary puts on the back of his electric golf cart to extend its range. No, that's not what I'm talking about at all. Also, if you're wondering about the funny little spots on my face, <laughs> That's what happens when you don't watch where you're walking while recording videos on RVs. And that's what I got for you this month. Once again, I've asked you a bunch of questions. You know, what are you seeing in your neck of the woods? What do you think where are things gonna go? I'd love to hear your feedback and input. Um, or if there's maybe a big story I've missed and you're kind of curious about something, leave me a note and I'll see if I can't shed some insights on that topic. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Or it might be something I can dig into next month. And if you appreciate how we go out of our way to showcase these things and just put the real world stats and numbers out there so that whether you're you're curious or whether you're serious if you're thinking about maybe getting into an RV or your next RV or, or you know maybe not an RV or whatever if you appreciate how we put this information out there for you whether it's pretty or not hit that subscribe button really appreciate all the uh, continued participation support uh, fellowship that you folks offer every day thank you very very kindly it's very humbling and again the more we can spread the kind of message I think the more we can help more people so that share button or uh, cost you nothing and the like button on the video also cost you nothing um, when you are ready in the meantime we're ready but until then we'll see you next month with some more info take care stay safe have fun and happy camping everyone mm -hmm.